Amen. You can be seated. And it is sort of the start of the conference, but at the same time, I felt like sticking with the uh, the series that we're in. It's going through Book of Revelation and the end times prophecy, and uh, and it works. It works very well for the events of this week as we as we see now. Chapter 12, we've talked about this, is kind of a logical division. As you're reading through, you, you can kind of understand, although a lot of people don't, they don't want to accept that, and they want to make events that happen tagged on to the events of chapter 11. Uh, like I said, some people believe that that seventh seal, I mean, sorry, seventh uh, trumpet judgment is everything that's going to happen in the next few chapters, and I don't, uh, I don't see that. Maybe I'm misinterpreting what some of them say, but... I think it's pretty clear here. In fact, in verse 6 there, you see this time period again of, of 1,203 score days. There's that three and a half years again. Now, if you've already read up to this point, you've already seen three and a half years. You've seen the, anti, I mean the, uh, uh, yeah, the Antichrist rising, and then you've seen another three and a half years of God's wrath being poured out. That's, that's the seven years. <laughs> so... To tag on another three and a half years seems kind of absurd. And he says it again there in verse 14, uh, for time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Obviously talking about this time of tribulation where God's people, and we'll get to that in a minute, are being persecuted. Uh, and, uh, and, they're in, and God is getting them through that. All right. And so uh, the, the point I want to make in this message or what I want to focus on if you look there at the very beginning, we see uh, talk about this woman and her seed. And then we see also a dragon uh, on the scene. In fact, they're called the two wonders. Verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And we'll come back to that here in a second. But then if you look at verse 3, there appeared another wonder. All right, so two wonders. The first wonder is this woman, okay? Uh, something that, you know, it's, 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 I don't know, mysteries, maybe not the right word, but just something that would cause them to wonder, what is this? You know, let's look at this and let's think about this. And then you have the woman, and then now you have in verse 3, uh, Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, you can't help but see that and at least picture Christ. You know, Christ and the serpent is waiting to devour the child. You can't help but naturally probably go to Herod as you've read that story in Luke. And, and, uh, and you see that, that there's cer certainly something going on. But then you also see... A war. In verse 7, there's a war between Michael and the angels. And a lot of mysterious things here, which have caused, again, here's the thing that we're always going to get when it comes to reading and studying prophecy, is there's thousands of interpretations. <laughs> right? Maybe not thousands, I don't know. But people thinking, well, this is what this means to me. This is what this means to me. They might be right. right? And I could sit here and try to give my opinions as to what this uh, represents what this stands for. I could be right. I could be wrong. I want to submit that it's not super important that we get all those details right as long as we catch the overall picture of what's going on. And I think you can do that in Revelation, especially when you're comparing it to Daniel and, and uh, Jesus' words in Matthew 24 and all. But here, what I think that you see for sure in this, new, this chapter that starts a new section, right? a new uh, retelling of the events, uh, in chapter 1 and 11. And I believe what you see here right off the bat is that there are two forces at work in heaven and on earth. And that's the title of the message, Two Forces at Work in Heaven and on Earth. Okay, it call, uh, We read this, or it said two wonders. Two wonders. Also notice verse 1, 3, and 7. We're talking about heaven. Okay, So it says, There appeared a great wonder in heaven. Obviously, this is a vision that John's getting, but he's looking and he's seeing in heaven these events take place. He sees this woman in heaven. Verse 3, there appeared another, another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. So he's seeing it in heaven, this vision. Okay, But now also look at verse 4 through 6, and we see that also this, these events take place on earth. 
And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, to devour her, children, her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. Clearly, these are talking about nations on earth. Not nation, there's not nations in heaven, right? And so uh, we're talking about events on earth. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Again, obviously talking about Jesus. Jesus was on the earth, right? He was, uh, uh, he was uh, being, you know, he was to rule the nations with the rod of iron. And then her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So basically what you see in the first five verses, you see a retelling of the entire, <laughs> in essence, the entire Bible up until this point, right? So uh, we're seeing this all over again. In fact, we're already going to get into the three and a half years of the tribulation. Right, so he really quickly get, gets to the point. And now in this second telling, he's going to give a lot more details about the beast and, uh, and, and about certain, certain events in the following chapters that we didn't see so clearly in, in chapter 6 through 11. Okay, so I don't believe it's super important to understand exactly who the woman is, but I want to throw out some thoughts about different ideas that people have, and maybe when you read that you can... You can think about it, but then I want to actually kind of show where how all these views, I think, kind of go together and still present the big picture. Really, no matter which of, the, which of these that you believe the woman is talking about, if it's talking about one of these, it really it just fulfills a greater picture uh, of, of this what it's representing. Okay, So number one, some people think, um, of course, this is still introduction, but uh, some people think that it's a reference to Mary. That makes sense. If you're reading this, uh, you know, and you've already read through the Gospels, and now you're reading this, and you see there's a woman, and she's going to give child, and and Satan is trying to destroy the child. Naturally, you would say, well, it's got to be talking about Mary, all right? If you read a lot of the old commentaries and see what people have believed throughout history, probably the majority of people, I think, uh, say that this represents the church, is what they would call it. Now, I don't even like saying the church because. A lot of times when you hear that terminology, it's Catholic church, uh, so-called church, ca talking about the church, uh, the church Catholic or universal. And so, uh, so really that doesn't make sense. Okay? But, the, but the point is uh, they're, talk, they're recognizing that there is this group of people you know, that, rep that this woman represents. And, uh, and I'll get to that in here in a minute. Some say it's Israel. I don't know if you ever heard that. Like it's clearly, I've heard of clearly talking about Israel. Well, what do you mean clearly? Well, did you notice there's 12 stars? And if you go back to Genesis, you know, there's 12 stars in Jacob's vision, right? Or, or there's 12 stars. Those represent the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Well, it could be, but they could also represent the 12 disciples. I mean, if you want to just start throwing 12s out there, you know, I don't necessarily believe that it's Israel, but again, if you're going to take that into the account of the Old Testament, I'm going to show you where all these kind of work together in a sense. Okay, and uh, and here's the final one that I think uh, is is sort of key. Okay, now I'm not saying this is the exact interpretation, but it's kind of key to understanding everything that's going on in this chapter, and that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter 3. And this is, uh, trying to remember what the fancy title was they taught us in school. It was like uh, the proto-evangelism or evangel... Something is basically the gospel before the gospel is what they said. Like this is the first place where the gospel is mentioned. And it, it is interesting for sure. At the curse, because mankind sinned and, and God kind of deals out the curses, if you would, as it applies to these individual groups of people. And to the woman, uh, he, he gives certain uh, uh, curses as well. And then to Satan, he says this, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Now look, I don't believe that he meant that particular serpent that was in the garden and Eve. I don't think that's what he's talking about. Now I believe this is what I this is my understanding. 
that this serpent was a being, okay? I think it was probably like a dragon. Of course, Satan is called the dragon, you know, but I think the be this being may have been a type of a dragon, and it was literally demon-possessed. This is my, my feelings. I could be wrong on this. It's literally demon-possessed so that the, the, the or, or possessed by Satan, I should say, and so that Satan is actually talking through this creature, all right? Now, I believe that literal creature was cursed, and probably that's where we got the species or not, uh, whatever, the, the kind of, uh, of animal that's, that we think of as snakes. Okay, interesting. Like, I could go into a lot of thoughts on that, but I won't. <laughs> but, uh, and then it crawls on its belly as part of the curse. But that was just on the human, I mean, on the, uh, the natural uh, creature. You know what I'm saying? But the actual uh, reference here is something far greater, far greater than that. So as a kid, I remember thinking, well, maybe it's not talking about Eve, but maybe it's talking about women in general, right? And so the woman is going to be at enmity with the serpent. And my thinking was, hey, women hate snakes, so, you know, that's, that's probably what it means. <laughs> Until I met women that actually liked snakes, and I thought, that's not natural. Something's wrong there. <laughs> but the fact is, whether or not there's anything to be said about that, because women typically do hate snakes, but it, hey, God, how many guys here hate snakes as well? <laughs> so, uh, so, but the point is not actually talking about that creature, which was a snake crawling on its belly, but actually talking about the seed of Satan himself, who had possessed that snake, all right? And the seed of the woman, I'm going to show you here in a second, was not actually talking about just every child that she has, although that, that would definitely apply, because obviously she's the mother of all living, the Bible says, but it's actually talking about those who are spiritually born, okay, born again, born of God. And you actually see that when you see the line of Seth and then you see uh, men begin to call upon the name of the Lord and all that kind of stuff. And so I believe it's simply saying that there's going to be a, a spiritual force, if you will, a spiritual seed or a line of people who are going to be at enmity with a spiritual force that is satanic. Okay, And so uh, obviously you could follow all through the Old Testament and see certainly it appears like Satan is specifically trying to destroy the line of Christ, right? Let's get rid of those Hebrew children, you know, let's kill them. Uh, let's do it. Just you go down the list and, and Satan's always there ready to attack. And we understand that's been Satan's job, if you will, seeking whom he may devour and, and, uh, and being an accuser of the brethren and all, causing all manner of evil in this fallen and corrupt world. But, uh, but there is an evil force that constantly interacts against God's people on earth. Okay, this is my, my first point here. It's an evil spiritual force that is constantly at work, all right? Ephesians chapter 6, you're probably familiar with the uh, armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That's key right there. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then it talks about taking on the whole armor of God, and then praying, and stand, uh, stand fast and all. So here's the idea, and I don't think I probably have to convince anybody in here, but there is an evil spiritual force at work that the powers uh the principalities and the powers are rulers of the darkness of this world doesn't anybody understand i mean i mean look at, at some of the things that people are standing for even in our government right and pe the things that 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 wicked people are trying to pass and get past about abortion and stuff like that and and you would you would look at this and say well what kind of a wicked person would actually, you know, want to kill babies? What kind of a wicked person would actually want to promote homosexuality or try to promote, you know, these wicked things of the world? And you look at the government and people in high positions, and they're trying to, like, you know, just make this a big deal. We, we, I don't know if you heard the ad, man. Every time you see something on YouTube or whatever, like a, uh, there's like a little ad that pops up, and then it says, 
Robert Marshall. <laughs> you ever heard that? Robert Marshall. I didn't know who Robert Marshall was until ever the smear campaign, and they're trying to say all this bad stuff about Robert Marshall. Again, I'm not endorsing him. I don't even know who he is. But here's what I know. The more I heard this smear campaign, the more I wanted to vote for Robert Marshall. <laughs> because this lady literally, one of the advertisements literally is like, Robert Marshall wants to get rid of abortion. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't understand. What's the problem? Any, we think any normal person would want that, right? But look, there are powers in force, powers that be, that are working among the leaders. I don't care who the leader is in office. Who gets an office? There's going to be powers uh, that are working hard to get them to make bad decisions, right? And, and, it's, and it, obviously it happens all the time. You think of throughout history, and some of the guys that you would think would be the most, the strongest, most conservative, at least they claim to be, right? And, and everyone thought that they were. And then you look at some of the bills they passed, and you're like, what were they thinking, right? And because there's always things going. I like how people always say, well, you know, the devil made me do it, or man, the devil's really fighting me today, or the devil, you know. And I've often thought, and I don't know how this works exactly, but I've often thought, well, I don't think the devil is... Omni omniscient like God, you know, or, or, or omnipresent like God. I don't think he can be everywhere at the same time, right? So chances are you've probably never interacted with Satan, <laughs> okay? You maybe have had demons kind of oppress you and all that, but you want to know where Satan is. He's probably in politics somewhere. <laughs> He's probably working. He's probably got a seat in the Oval Office somewhere, you know what I mean? Or, or in the uh, U.N., or in the Middle East, or in any of these places. I mean, you know, his, he's working some evil in the, in the higher up places. We don't even know. We don't even understand. Okay. Now, we don't, we, we don't see these things happening. You understand? I, I love this story about Elisha and the serv servant, and, uh, and, the, and they're, they're surrounded by this army, and he's like, oh, no, we're outnumbered. We're going we're gonna to be killed. I'm paraphrasing, of course. We're going to be killed. And he says, oh, that's all right. You know, those that are on our side are more than those on their side. And he's looking like, no, there's a huge army and there's only two of us. What are you talking about? And then God allows his eyes to be open and he sees like these uh, uh, angels and I, I believe chariots. I think they're on, on horses or chariots, right? And they're angels. And, uh, and he sees all this uh, innumerable host, right? And, and we don't see it, but all around us, there's innumerable host of angels, good angels, probably ministers, you know, for the Lord. And then there are demonic forces all around us too. Also ministers, right? Because the Bible talks about, uh, uh, you know, they transform themselves into the ministers of light even, right? So they appear to be good sometimes, but really they're evil. We just don't know. We have to trust the Lord. We have to gird up ourselves and, uh, and be watching and be waiting and, and, and arm ourselves with the armor of God and take, uh, and take heed because we just don't know what's going on around us. But one thing we know, there are evil forces, working all the time, okay? And they have been all through the Old Testament. They are working in the New Testament. They'll be working all the way up. You know what? Even after the millennium, even after the millennium, the devil comes back and tries to raise up an army, and then God just rains fire down and just destroys them all, and that's the end. But there's a power, uh, evil force that is working. There's no doubt about that. But... uh but it, it is, as long as this world has been in a corrupted state, when man fell, it's been corrupted ever since. In the Garden of Eden, things weren't quite the same. Now we're in a corrupted world. Uh, I don't know all the curses that came as a result of that, but here's what I know. Everything must die now. We understand that. We must die our, as far as our bodies must die. Everything on this world is corrupted. And so he says there's only one thing that is is, is, you know, as far as spiritually, uh, uh, what, am I think, what am I trying to say? Okay, there's an evil force that's fighting against something that has the incorruptible, right? The Bible talks about that which is incorruptible, right? And this is the incorruptible seed, okay? Now, here's what Galatians 3, 29 says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. See, now if you keep reading after Genesis 3 and you begin to watch and you see the sons of Seth and then you follow that up into Noah and then Noah, you know, uh, you know, obviously you know what Ham did 
uh, and then there's a curse upon them. But it seems like the Bible follows the line of Shem at that point, and then you come to Abraham, and it's like you're following all the righteous seed right there who've called upon the name of the Lord, and uh, and that seed. Now, anybody in the whole world, like I said this morning in Iola, God has always been a whosoever will God. Anybody could come to him, all right? But there was a particular group of people that seemed to be uh, professing, Christ, uh, professing the Lord, and, uh, and so that, that followed on, and that, and that was known, become known as Abraham's seed. And really, but you could follow it back and say that's Eve's seed. And the uh, and Bible says, if ye are Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. I don't understand what the confusion is. The Bible's pretty clear about that. Amen. We're children of Israel. If we believe, if we have faith in, uh, in the Lord, in Jesus Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. 1 Peter 1.23 says, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, so when we are born of the seed, if you will, or the word of God, and we're born again, we, we are part of that incorruptible thing. <laughs> the word of God is incorruptible. God is incorruptible, and we become part of that. In fact, the Bible even says that we, uh, uh, here it is right here, 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now that used to trip me up a little bit. I remember thinking, whoa, does that mean like we won't sin if we're saved? I mean, that can't be true, right? Here it says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. But guess what? This flesh is born of Adam. This flesh isn't born of God, but the inner man is born of God. And guess what? The inner man, once it's born again, cannot sin. And therefore, it's incorruptible. Therefore, it can go to heaven, all right? So it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. That's the inner man, all right? Obviously, this flesh can sin. If you say you have no sin, same book, uh, then you are a liar and, and you deceive yourself, okay? So Jesus, look at 1 John. Well, uh, I could have just turned there anyway, I guess, because we're going to go to 1 John 8. And it's, I mean, 1 John uh, 3, I'm sorry. And I just read verse 9, but let's go. Uh, come on. Let's go to uh, verse 8 there. 1 John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose... The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Okay? So from the beginning, you know, the since the devil was able to deceive the woman into sinning, and mankind uh, and man followed suit, and so death passed upon all the world, for all have sinned. We understand that from that time Satan has been fighting. Satan has been working evil, and the Bible says that that the, God, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. Okay, so the first thing we saw was that there's an evil, uh, evil spiritual force that constantly interacts against God's people. Okay, but we also understand that with that, there is a, a godly, incorruptible spiritual force that is on our side. And, and as, badly, you know, as long as we arm up, arm ourselves with the... Uh, armor of God, then we're battling Satan, okay? Look at uh, Romans 16, 20. Now, remember that, remember that chapter in uh, Genesis 3 that said, And he shall bruise your head. Talking to the seed of Satan. He shall bruise his head. Okay, look at uh, Romans 16, verse 20. He's talking to uh, the church here, and he says, the, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I think Paul understood what Genesis 3 was talking about right there. And he say, hey, the God of peace is going to bruise Satan's uh, under your feet shortly. Amen. Amen. He's going to use his church. His church will endure. His church will prevail. And, uh, and, and Satan will be bruised under his feet, just like was prophesied. All right? Now, unfortunately, until the end, until Jesus comes back and he rules and reigns, 
You know, we must endure suffering as earthly beings, not just suffering in the flesh that's normal. Everybody gets sick. Everybody gets pain. Everybody has normal sufferings on this earth. We're all going to die, right? Uh, not only that, but we also endure the persecution from Satan and the persecution from people that uh, are doing his bidding, if you would. And uh, in, the spi- in, in, in our spiritual beings, uh, we can be happy and say, hey, we're citizens of heaven. And we, you know, we spiritually cannot sin and we're set free and we don't have to worry about dying. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. Praise the Lord. And we can rejoice in that. Yet in this flesh, because we're living as Christians, because we're following Christ, we will suffer persecution. And the Bible makes it very clear. And you think it's bad now. I mean, you think it's bad now. You look around at our society. Maybe you've had a little bit of persecution here and there, or maybe not so much us, but friends, people that we know, a little bit of persecution. But you think about that, and you're reading the Bible, and here's what we know. The evil force will get worse before it gets better. Right? Now, there's been some, some dark times in history that we don't know anything about. I mean, you read Fox's Book of Martyr, Martyrs, you read about stuff that happened in what's known as the, uh, the Dark Ages and, and the Reformation, and you read some of these things and you say, man, how could it get any worse than that? And you hope that we would never see anything like it. Now, thank the Lord, I mean, you're in the USA where you ha- you pro- the chances of you seeing anything like that are very, very slim. But there are other countries and there are other people who are, have to go into hiding and to go into secrecy to be able to worship God. And even to have a Bible would get them killed or thrown into jail or something. And so there are places that are still going through that right now. Just praise the Lord that we don't have to. Which is why I believe the United States has been used more than any other uh, country to spread the gospel throughout the world. And to preach the gospel and to write lots of uh, 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 books and to get the word out there because we've suffered very little persecution and had to do very little hiding. Now, unfortunately, it's turned people into very weak Christians and and very lukewarm Christians because they haven't had that persecution. Well, guess what? It's coming. (laughs) Okay, it's coming. Sometime it's coming. I'm not saying I'm just like looking forward to it. I am looking forward to Christ ruling and reigning on the earth, so I'll take it, you know what I mean, when it comes. But the Bible says clearly the evil force will get worse before it gets better. 2 Timothy 3, 12 and 13 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So you can ex- expect it's going to get worse and worse. Look at Matthew 24. I was telling my wife, I think er- probably every sermon that I've preached from the book of Revelation, I've gone, to re- I've gone to Matthew 24. I just can't help it. You just start reading it and you're like, well, that's what Jesus said. In Matthew 24, look at verse 4. And Jesus lays this out about how bad things are going to get. And Jesus said, uh, answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Hey, I've been hearing a lot about earthquakes lately, uh, haven't you? And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, so uh, hey, if you get to that point, if you're still alive and you're going through this persecution and this suffering, guess what? Just hang it on a little bit longer. Okay, and you'll be saved out of those days. The Lord will come back. And uh, once he comes back, you're safe. And he pours out his wrath upon the earth at that point. Okay, And so uh, look at verse 21. <clears throat> For then, or it's still continuing. Okay, You're going to see in verse 15 the, the uh, abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel. That comes at, after the three and a half years. We know that. 
Okay, and then it says uh, you better flee at that point. You know, times are going to get real rough. Verse uh, 23 says, uh, uh, I mean, verse 24 says, what did I say originally? 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now, there's been some really dark times in this world. There's been some really bad things, but it says, in this time of great tribulation, which if you study it out with Revelation, that happens right before the coming of Christ. That happens right at that time when the people, you know, in heaven, the altars, I mean, the uh, souls under the altar are saying, you know, how long, Lord, <laughs> before you avenge our blood? You know, this is a really rough time, but it's only for a pretty short amount of time, a couple of a couple months. Okay, and uh, and so. There's great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. All right, this is what the Bible uh, talks about. So unfortunately, things are going to get uh, worse before they get better. <clears throat> now, look at Revelation 12 again. Revelation 12 like I said, verse 1 through 6 kind of gets us up to speed. It gets us all the way up to the tribulation, okay? And the dragon is going after the woman, and the woman is going to be in the wilderness, and, uh, and, and, and she's there for that space of three and a half years, okay? And then there's war in heaven. Now, this is very interesting. And I, for the sake of time, I'm probably not going to spend a lot of time in this. Maybe it'll come back again sometime, but... But there's this war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against, this is verse 7, against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels. Now here are two spiritual forces in heaven fighting against each other. We don't know anything about it. We can't see it. We can't contribute to it necessarily. Okay, but it's going on. And then it says, uh, and prevailed not. Okay, the devil or the dragon prevailed not against Michael and the angels. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil. And in case you didn't know who we're talking about, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now wait a minute. You say I thought Satan fell from heaven a long time ago. And he took a third part of the angels with him, and those were the fallen angels. Well, here's where people get that when they say when they when they say that they get that from this verse right here. But this verse right here says that this has not happened yet. Okay. Now, obviously, Satan's fallen. We see that in Isaiah and in Ezekiel, uh, reference to Satan falling, and he was a cherub in the beginning, and he was in Eden and all that, which we know because we saw the serpent was there, and he was obviously already fallen at that state. And so he was fallen way back in the beginning. We understand that. But it appears he still has some kind of presence or some kind of ability to get up into heaven and to talk to God. Now, it doesn't take long for you to think about the book of Job, and that's exactly what he does throughout the book of Job is he's an accuser of the brethren and he's and he's accusing Job and he's wanting to go afflict Job and to do all that to prove a point to God or whatever. And I don't understand all the workings of that. I don't know the spiritual world and how, how that plays a part exactly, but we know that this is what the Bible says goes on. But on that day, okay, and again, this is around the time of uh, the the three, uh, three and a half years, see verse six talks about that, about the three and a half years. And at that time, the devil is cast out of heaven. And it's as though he, he's saying, you're never going to come show your face around here anymore. And you're never going to be able to afflict uh, my people anymore, right? Uh, except for this very short period of time, which would be known as the great tribulation, okay? So, and that, that great, uh, let me start verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is salvation, uh, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcome him, oh, because they were so righteous and they did all these great works and they worked so hard and they earned their salvation. No, no, no. And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. They over, we can't overcome Satan by our works. 
Did you notice back there in Ephesians 6 when it talks about taking on the armor of God and in the power of His might and all those things? That has nothing about your righteousness, nothing about your deeds. You can't do it without God, right? Remember, there's a spiritual warfare and there's two forces at work. There's an evil force and then there's a godly force and they're at work. And guess what they're battling over? You and me and the whole world, okay? That's what they're battling over. And the only way to overcome the evil forces, Satan, is by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Must be born again, must be saved by the blood of the Lamb. Nothing that we can do in our own work. And overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. Now, very few... Very few uh, give their lives up for the Lord nowadays. Now, throughout history, church history, there's been a lot who have burned at the stake or what have you. But very few nowadays would have to give up their life for the Lord. But, you know, as I read about events that are going, and we'll talk more about that because he's going to give more details in a minute or, or in the future uh, chapters. But there's going to come a time where you can't buy, sell, trade unless you have the mark of the beast and, uh, and if you don't have the bark of the beast, that's somehow, uh, somehow they're, they're going to track you. They're going to know. <laughs> you say, oh, no, man, I'm going to live off the grid and I'm going <laughs> to, you know. It's so weird, like thinking, like, how did they for so many years interpret Revelation without Internet and, uh, and all the sources that we have today? It's like it's so clear now. We understand how these things take place. We understand how they're able to watch the two witnesses in the street lying there all night and we understand how all these take place we all understand how somebody can uh, buy sell and trade you know without money but uh but by receiving this mark or whatever all of a sudden i mean we don't know the detail the exact details but we know the technology's there and uh and uh, man i was just talking about uh all right give me a little, a little let, let me get a little conspiracy theory here <laughs> in uh, iola i was just talking about a lapel system I, we bought in iola and I was talking to Brother uh, uh, Josh, uh, uh, and he said, we, we were talking about, I, I had to buy this new system. And I had to buy it because I thought the old system was messed up and wasn't working, which it, it, it does have some problems. But, but basically, long story short, it, be, it ended up being just the microphone. All right, so I had to buy a new microphone anyway. But I bought this new system, and I said, well, you know, it's actually illegal for me to have that old system. Because the government said that you can no longer operate on a certain frequency that that old system went on. They literally, like the government said, we want to own this frequency, you know, and uh, and so you have to operate on a different frequency. So literally, if churches have, after I think it was last July, if you have a lapel mic that operates on a certain frequency, you're actually breaking the law. <laughs> I don't know how they could ever enforce it, but but you are. And he said, actually, you, he said, it started way before that. He said, do you remember back when... Uh, when you had TV and the TVs had the old antennas and you could get a handful of channels, right? And then all of a sudden they said, hey, we can no longer operate on that, I guess it's analog system, brother, brother David probably knows, I don't know, the analog system or whatever. You had to go to digital. And back in those days, you had to get these little rabbit ears and it, and it, and it uh, transformed it from that old system to this new frequency. I don't know how all that works, to this digital format. I don't know how that all works. But he was saying, it's pretty interesting when they did that because what they were doing is like, hey, under that old system, it was almost impossible to track you. It was almost impossible to know what, you know, what you're using, what you're watching, what you're doing. But under digital, it's so easy to track people and what they're doing. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, I, I never thought about that. And I'm not trying to scare anybody necessarily, but look, you're smart enough to know the way things are going and the, where, the, where the Bible says that they're going to end up. Look, there are evil forces at work. And you say, oh, you mean Joe Biden? Well, yeah, I mean, he's evil, but it's not so much him as it is the evil forces that are working in him. Did I say that? Oh, can I do that from the pulpit? I'm just kidding. I don't care. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, like, you understand, like, you can point to anybody and say, oh, that's a wicked person. Well, it's just because they're not saved. Now, whether or not they're a reprobate, probably Satan, the, the evil uh, forces want them to work. Maybe many of them demon-possessed. I wouldn't doubt it. And they're just literally doing what the demons 
tell him to do. Okay, so I just think that that is a, something is going to lead up to this point. At the midpoint, after the midpoint, this great tribulation that we just read about, that is unlike anything that's ever happened, unlike anything that ever will happen. And all I'm saying is when it gets to that point, and you see the, the, uh, the something of desolation, what's it called? Abomination of desolation. You see that, and you read that in chapter 24 of Matthew, and he says, flee into the mountains, just go, go, right? The time is real short at that point, and you just need to just kind of run for your lives because it's going to be really, really rough at that time. But guess what? He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Right. So we have spiritual uh, force, evil force that constantly interacts against God's people. The evil force will get worse before it gets better. We got time because I don't have to run back to Iola. So let's go to Mark 5. <laughs> Mark 5. Besides, the pizza is not here till 430. Mark chapter 5 and look at verse 7 this is an interesting story uh, uh, Jesus comes across this guy who interestingly look at verse 5 and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs I mean who hangs out in the graveyards but have you noticed that our society is just like this, just love, gore, and death, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, man, it's just, it's just crazy, and, and every time Halloween, like, I, I, I believe most people that celebrate Halloween are, it's harmless, they don't know what they're doing, they're just, you know, love candy, and parties, and stuff like that, but overall, it, it's a wicked holiday, yeah. the origins are wicked, the things that go on are wicked, and I just, every, time around this time of year i just feel like this evil presence maybe it's somewhat in my head but i think that the devil just loves this time of year and what's interesting is to look around and see people yeah they might put up a couple uh uh strings of lights for christmas you know <laughs> they might i don't know what other holiday they was so easter they might have some blow up bunnies or something in their yard which is weird but uh but halloween halloween there's a lady in our town that we uh, uh we kind of know uh, a little bit of their background and they're pretty much like trying to look for the handouts and the the welfare and all this kind of stuff and yet, halloween time you drive by and it's like every blow up uh halloween character that you can find and the lights and all this kind of stuff and people get into it they just love it and hollywood you know look how uh that harry potter just took off and for a while i don't even know if it's a big thing anymore but just for a while everything you see just like harry potter harry potter harry potter and there's just this love for that and i i'm sure it gets a lot weir weirder than that but that's about the extent of what uh what i know but here's this guy and he's demon possessed and he's hanging out in the tombs and he's crying you know what does that sound like well i don't know you ever listen to heavy metal <laughs> <laughs> and he's cutting himself with stones. What's the deal, man? I became a youth pastor, and I found out all these people cutting themselves, all these kids cutting themselves. Where does that come from? You know, What is causing kids to want to cut themselves and bleed? That's weird. <laughs> okay, I don't understand it. But, And I'm not saying everyone that cuts themselves is demon-possessed, but I'm saying, look, this is what happens. Someone's demon-possessed, it's like they're just trying to get out of their body. They just don't want to, you know... Uh, that that person that exists in there, their conscience or whatever, is like wanting to get out of there or something. I don't know. De and the devil's just kind of tearing them apart. And so, uh, uh, I, and by devil, I mean little D there, the demon. Okay, so anyway, uh, he uh, day and night he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying, cutting himself with stones. Verse 6, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. What? What do you mean? A demon's a guy full of demons worshiping Jesus? Well, here's what he says. And he cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he came, uh, for he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he's like, Hey, don't torment me. Now, that's a little bit cloudy. You don't know exactly what's going on there. But when you compare it to Matthew, look at Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, 
And look at verse 29. Okay, same story. Uh, let me see here. Coming out of the tombs, exceeding fear, so that no man might pass by that way. Verse 29. And behold, they... Now, in the other one, it says he cried out. In this one, it says they cried out. It's the same thing, all right? Those spirits inside of him are crying out, and it's coming out as one voice out of the man's mouth. And so you could say it either way. But here it says, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Before the time? So, look, the demons know that their time is limited. They know that there is no eternal salvation for them, and they've only got a short amount of time, so they're doing all they can before that time comes. And we know that the devil knows his end is the same way. Look at Revelation 20. Revelation 20, look at verse 10. This is why things are going to get so evil and so dark during that time. And the devil that deceived them was cast in... I'm sorry, that's the wrong place. That is his eternal torment. Uh, amen for that. But look at... Uh, go back to chapter 12. I wasn't ready to go there yet. Revelation chapter 12. Look at verse 12. Okay. Now, in verse 11, we just read how the children of God overcome the devil by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now chapter, I mean, verse 12 says this, therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of earth and of the sea for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. You know, he's got, Three and a half years at that point before his destruction. He knows he has a short time. So what's he going to do? He's going to try everything he can to get rid of the Christians and persecute them and really to destroy all mankind is what he's wanting to do. But then, uh, obviously, Christ is going to come back and, and, and take his, uh, his children out of here. But, uh, but he's saying this, Therefore rejoice ye heavens. So the last point I want to make is this. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that we are only here temporarily. Earth is only our home, our dwelling place for a short amount of time. Okay? And what a great thing because we already know there's a spiritual warfare. We already know that evil force is going to get worse before it gets better. But you know what? Even though we aren't physically in heaven right now, the Bible does say we're seated in heavenly places, right? And even though uh, we don't see it now, we are citizens of heaven. So when he says... Rejoice, ye heavens. Hey, I'm rejoicing already because I know what the end is. I know that even if this body dies from persecution or whatever, that my eternal soul is secure. And I know that the, that the power of Satan is only going to last so much longer, and then he's done for. Now, now look at chapter 20. You already know what I'm going to read, and I already started reading it, but we're going to read it again because I like this verse. Chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. Forever and ever. He knows that's the end uh, of his, his, his decision to depart from God and to, uh, you know, however that took place. I won't preach a message on that, but uh, his decision was one that leads to eternal torment and eternal uh, suffering in the lake of fire. So we can rejoice now that we don't have that fate. We can rejoice now that his power is only going to last for so long. And even as Christians, the damage he can do to Christians as the accuser of the brethren, hey, one day he's going to get kicked out, and he'll never be able to come up to heaven and accuse, uh, accuse the brethren anymore. Okay, so, uh, so here's the thing. I want to close by saying this. What are we to do as these two forces continue to battle in heaven and on earth, and they're battling, and we're you know, uh, kind of just waiting to know what to do and, and what God's will is and what's going to happen to us? Well, obviously, we got a job to do. We understand that. 
And this week our focus, of course, is on evangelism. Kind of always our focus here and with, with this group. I know we're, that's kind of what we're here for is to evangelize, and it's a mission work here in Kansas City. And, and so I understand that's our focus, but, but I want to submit something else. Praise the Lord, we've seen a lot of souls saved. There's no doubt about that. We've knocked a whole lot of doors, presented the gospel a whole lot of times. Praise the Lord. And I would never make light of that or say that we're not doing a good job. That's a great job. We need to keep up everything that we're doing. But I want to add one other level of, uh, of effort into this evangelism thing, and that is prayer. Okay, This morning uh, in the first service at Iola, we did... Uh, uh, I did a sermon, and I, it's just this, pray, 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 okay? And I went through Daniel chapter 6, where Daniel, three times a day, even when he knows a law, a decree was signed that said, hey, he's going he's gonna to be thrown into the lion's den if he does this. He did it anyway, because his practice was three times a day, he would get on his knees and worship before the Lord. Then it says he would pray, right? And it also says he would make supplication, so he was actually asking God for something. He would worship, he would pray, and then he would thank God, it says, thanking God. And that's really, if you think about the model prayer that Jesus gave, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Then what? Then what? Pray, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our, sins, our, our debts as we forgive. I'm mixing up two, uh, two different passages here. Forgive us our sins sins as we forgive those who sin against us, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, one says debt and one says sin. Okay? And, uh, and so, and then thine is the kingdom, thine is the power. So, so, so we see at end of that is, is, is praising the Lord. Okay, so, so there's a level of worshiping, there's a level of praying and asking and giving petition for God, and then there's a level of praising and thanking Him for whatever He does. You know, and I said, you know, I would love, for instance, let's say my goal is, man, November 8th, friend day. And I just want to really just fill up our pews and have all these people here and all this kind of stuff. That, that's a goal that I would have, a goal that I would like to see. And let's say I'm praying for that and I'm worshiping God and I'm saying, God, you know, this is all your decision to make. You know, I love you and, and, and I want you to do whatever. But my, what I'm asking for is that you would just have, you know, there'd be no hindrances and everybody's feeling well and the weather's right. Now, maybe I'm praying for specifics, which, by the way, when you're praying to God, pray for specifics. You know, here's what a lot of people do. A lot of people will be like, Lord, I just pray that you just save Kansas City. How many think that if you pray that, God's just miraculously going to save everybody in Kansas City? <laughs> it doesn't really work that way, right? We can't, you know, we can't make... He, he won't make somebody get saved. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is a choice. And so um, it's dependent on a choice. And so we can only pray, you know, that God would give us boldness to go preach, that God would uh, allow opportunities, that we would be clear. He would hinder, uh, uh, he would take away any hindrances or distractions. We can pray for specifics. We can pray for individuals that we know and, and pray that the Lord would do this and do that in their life. Or There are specifics that we can pray, and you should look for those specifics, right? If you just pray a real general prayer, that's probably evidence that your heart's not really in the prayer. Okay, and then sometimes we can say, "Hey, I pray all the time." You know, I pray, I pray five times a day, every time I eat. <laughs> I pray, God, thank you for this food. I pray. You say you eat five times a day? No, but I'm just saying. <laughs> but yeah, I probably do eat five times a day. <laughs> so, but you pray sometimes. Our efforts in life are they don't really produce anything if they're not here, if they're not for the right. Does that make sense? And our efforts in prayer can be the same way. We can say something with our mouth and it never really goes past the ceiling to God because we, our hearts weren't really in it. And, uh, and, and, and you know, that's true for everything we do in life. We could, fo we could purpose, I'm going to do this. Um, let's, let's say this, I'm, 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 I like doing artwork, okay? I like drawing. And so a lot of times somebody will ask an artist, like, how did you get so good? You know, and, and a lot of times they'll give this tip. Well, I'll tell you what, if you want to be a good artist, they'll say, just draw a lot. Just draw like every day. Just draw, 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 draw. Well, you know, you could draw something and develop some bad habits and like always draw something the exact same way and you'll never get better. So actually, that's bad advice. <laughs> you actually have to you actually have to learn, you know, how to 
do some things better and to strive. And, you, and there's always a little bit of a struggle involved in an effort. You know, you don't just do something just to do it or else nothing's being accomplished. You go to the gym. You could go to the gym every day of your life, right? But if you're just like, you're going to get in there. And I've seen this. I was in a gym. Uh, I was a member at a gym in Oklahoma City. And I went in, and there are a lot of older folks there. that they have, they're, I don't know if they were like a little club or what. You know, but they would come in there, and I would see them, and they would all be sitting down at the table, in the, like in the little break room there, and they'd be drinking coffee, and there'd be a box of donuts on the table. And I thought, boy, these people work out every day, but they're just drinking coffee and eating donuts. That's not really probably going to help their, uh, their health. So when you do something, you got to do it on purpose, and you got to do it with effort. Okay, so when we pray... Uh, It's kind of the same thing. And so Jesus said this about prayer. There's one thing is he said like this kind. Talking about you want something big to happen. I'm not talking about just whatever you want to happen to happen, but you've got to be in tune with the spirit on this. Okay. And and we're doing it so that we can bear fruit. Okay. But bearing fruit, uh, that's what pleases the Lord. And so uh, we want to do something for the Lord that's fruitful and that glorifies him. And you want to do something big. He says this type come without by prayer and fasting. Well, we all, you know, we can pray. We can mouth a few words of prayer. But the fasting, what he's talking about there, is actually putting some work into it and some sacrifice. And also, the challenge I gave them in Iola this morning, and I want to give to you guys now, is this week, I want, to, I want to suggest that you do three things, okay? Number one, I want you to clear off. Maybe you already do this, praise the Lord. If you don't, I want you to clear off three spots during the day. Okay, maybe two, two if you want to do it, but I recommend three times, like Daniel, and uh, and, and and clear off a spot where you're going to pray. Okay, I thought about doing a, a sign up sheet, right? Let's make sure like all these hours are filled or whatever. But no, I'm just just whatever you would be able to do according to your schedule and all. F- take those times to pray. I want you to make sure those prayers have a time of worship, you know, a time of specifically praying for things, however long it takes. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul said, I pray n- night and day, right, for different things. I mean, a lot, he had a lot of things on his prayer list, okay? Night and day, right? And uh, he had a lot of specifics. I pray daily for you that the Lord would do this, or I give thanks for you, and he, uh, he says all these things. So I want you to clear off the time. I want you to uh, worship. I want you to spend time asking for specifics about the week, maybe about your own life, whatever, too, but, but particularly about the week and friend day and all that. And then the last thing is I want you to, um, within reason, I mean, just whatever the Lord would allow, and I don't want you to uh, do anything that would, that would uh, be unhealthy or unwise, but that's between you and the Lord, is to sacrifice something. Give up a meal as part of your, uh, this praying time, or give up maybe some form of entertainment or some practice that you do on a regular basis that's not really, that's not really you know, doing anything for you you know, or for the cause of Christ. And I want you to give that time up uh, as part of your, your prayer time, okay? And I think if we can do those things every day this week, along with the efforts that are going to be uh, given towards soul winning, along with the preaching time that's going to help uh, encourage us and, and uh, get us pumped up, filled with the Spirit, I believe we're going to see some great, amazing things happen this week, Okay. And uh, and Lord willing, this will springboard us to kind of finish out this year really strong. And I personally am going to use this time uh, to motivate myself and make some personal commitments towards, you know, uh, the efforts that I put towards soul winning in this coming year. And so I want to challenge you guys all to do the same, okay? Because there are definitely two forces to make sure that we're suited up with the armor of God and that we're in prayer, and that we're uh, doing great things for the cause of Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this group of, of folks here, and the, um, the blessing they've been to me, and the encouragement. And I do thank you, Lord, for the, uh, uh, the opportunity that we have this coming week to focus on evangelism and to do the work of an evangelist. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunity for Chris Miller to come preach. I pray you bless. Uh, his travels, keep him safe, and uh, and help him uh, during his preparation to have just the right messages for us to hear, and, and that would motivate us and encourage him, Lord, as he goes out with the soul winning and he preaches to us, and and uh, and I pray that uh, we would encourage one another 
And most importantly, I want you to be glorified this week. We want to see a lot of fruit, Lord, for herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, the Word says in uh, John 15. So I pray, Lord, that you would uh, allow us to do that, Lord, according to our effort that we put forward into it, and, uh, and that we, you would work among us. In Jesus' name, amen.